Hello, I'm Bigantio Blackbird of Blackbird's Brew. Welcome to Norse Studies Week 5. This week, it's been all about the book work, uh, specifically the Heathen Handbook by Woden's Folkkin. I've been studying Section 3, God's Myths and the Cosmos. At least I have the first half of it. Uh, the reason I've gone this route is because I felt the need to be a little bit more focused this week, and my schedule did get a little bit more hectic than usual. I was trying to wrap up the last of September stuff and getting ramped up for October, and so, you know, I wasn't able to do as much as what I usually do. So there's uh, definitely a practical element behind this decision, but my other motivation is just because this section of the book is getting into more overtly religious themes and how to better analyze mythology. And so that isn't light work. It isn't light thinking because it goes so far beyond, you know, here's the facts for you to memorize, or here's more that you should have knowledge of, and here's some history and general philosophy. Uh, this is touching on a deeper and more spiritual level. So I'm, I'm wanting to make sure I give this section its proper due. So part one of this section is called myth. The authors begin by describing how even defining the word myth is a controversial business, even within heathen circles, because myth is a word that has been used as a pejorative in many circles to uh, discount ideas. It's also a very lazy accusation. It's just a way of, I'm not even going to think about this, and so I'm just going to call it a myth and never you know, ponder it ever again. So uh, that is annoying, and I can see why there would be some perhaps tension around the term in and of itself. Uh, but the authors gave their view that myth is essentially the highest, deepest, and most meaningful form of storytelling. It is a form of teaching us about the manner in which the world functions, and it tells us about the human condition, human nature, and that leaves us something to reflect upon about what does this mean for us and our relationships, the world around us, how does that all piece together? Now, the stories in myth go far beyond the humdrum of everyday life. It, it goes beyond, you know, operatic, but everything in them is extraordinary and it's otherworldly and it's dramatic on a scale that is truly beyond our comprehension, which is why we're still talking about them um, hundreds and thousands of years down the line and no doubt will into the future. Now, because the circumstances within myths are so different from what we experience in our everyday lives, uh, the authors made the point that that actually prevents us from carrying our prejudices and our preconceptions, at least to a degree, into the story itself. Because it's so different, we have to look at things with fresh eyes and an open mind because we're not comparing it uh, to anything else we have experienced or anything else we've gone through or anything else we've thought about before. So... That's as close to a clean slate as what you're likely to find. And the extremes that we see in myth, they actually uh, serve a very useful purpose because it makes the stories indelible in our mind. The point stands out. We don't forget, and it becomes so vivid that it's just part of our makeup, which is why it's important to continue reviewing these stories, going over these stories, passing them on. This isn't, you know, the laziness of storytelling that we see from Hollywood. You know, they regurgitate things because of lack of imagination or because they think it will make them more money instead of, you know, doing something original. But they're not actually doing uh, myth telling. They're not trying to serve a spiritual function, which is why any kind of spiritual story you will be that's something that people examine and go back to time and again. Now, part two was titled Examining Myth. And the authors talked about essentially four different methods that people generally use to examine myth. Uh, the first is actual or literal truth, where everything's taken at face value as having actually occurred. The second approach is mistaken explanation. The stories represent the way people try to explain, you know, large events or natural phenomena that wasn't uh, really understood in precise or scientific terms by the people who were telling the story. The third approach is distorted history. 
it's kind of like uh, the children's game of telephone. You know, they sit around in a circle and the first person whispers a message into one child's ear and they go around the circle. And by the time you come back around, uh, the message has been completely distorted. It has strayed. It's no longer what was originally conveyed. And the same thing can happen to ancient historical figures or world events. And, you know, deeds and qualities can be exaggerated. And over time, it becomes this legend that's more fiction than, than fact. Uh, but when we look at myths, we have to keep in mind that this is a very secularist view, and it's requiring people to deconstruct myths. Whenever you're hearing people use the word deconstruct, that should put us on our guard, especially as to their motivations. Um, and the idea is to, you know, to get to the bottom of what fact actually lies at the bottom of it all. But, and this approach is often used as an attempt to discredit spirituality and believers. Uh, so this is definitely an approach we would want to handle with extreme caution. And the fourth method is as a metaphor that these are comparisons between things that are similar with the object of teaching a lesson or making a point. Metaphors can be personification or as conveying what the ideal form of something is or that the story itself is a symbol for something else. And the authors went on at some length about their views about what method they believed best and why. Uh, for myself, I think there is value in at least um, going through the intellectual exercise of each of these methods, seeing how that affects the interpretations and what different things I get out of the stories. But uh, I have a fifth method, if I may be so bold. I like to try to put myself in the shoes of each person present in the myths. Who were they? What was their position in the story and, you know, in the totem pole in general? What did they have to gain or lose in that situation? What was their history with the other people present in the story? And by the time I do that, which can be a complicated state of affairs because sometimes we have a lot of different people popping up in certain stories. And by the time I've really looked at that and I tried to examine all the motivations of the people who were there, it has in a way clarified a great deal about what happened and why and why certain interactions went the way that they did. And of course, this does lead to theorizing. But I see that as part of the process. I think there's value in, de in devoting serious thought to the myths. And I don't think it's necessary to, uh, to use the method I lined out or the methods the authors were talking about to try to come to an immediate answer. I've been noticing that come up in a lot of conversations with pagans lately. They're wanting to find the answer. They want to get to the end. You know, they want to jot that down in their notebook and that, you know, that they want that to be that. Uh, but I don't, I think that kind of misses the point. I think we need to go through that thought process. We need that journey. It's part of laying the groundwork for our faith. And that includes spending time with ideas. And I think for a lot of us, and our hectic go, go, go society, we have been just trained out of the idea of spending time with anything. So uh, I think that does involve a bit of, of a rejection of external influences on our part to just kind of sit with these things, absorb them, and see where our thought process takes us. Then part three was titled Myth and Metaphor. The author stressed the importance of examining myths as stories that speak to who we are, as this allows the myths to come alive for us and to become a power and a spiritual force, and to aid in this process to better understand about why these stories really can affect us. Uh, they bring up Carl Jung, who was a famous Swiss psychologist, and Joseph Campbell, who was the famous American scholar, and his name is forever linked with the concept of myth. Now, according to Carl Jung, the mind is composed of several levels. We have the conscious mind. This is the part that is actively purposeful and under our direct control. It is our surface awareness. Then we have pre-consciousness, and his idea is that this is composed of memories that are easily accessible. Now, Jung believes that the conscious and the pre-conscious parts of the mind make up for less than a tenth of the mind's activity, which is rather a terrifying thought. Uh, the authors actually use the metaphor of the iceberg. You know, here's what you see above the water and the bulk of the iceberg lies beneath. Yeah, I mean, who knows what lurks within us? And that brings us to uh, Young's concept of the unconscious, where everything else within our mind supposedly takes place. It's not subject to the control of our conscious mind. It can't be accessed through our conscious mind. This is the home of instincts, desires, primordial fears, and the energy that drives our conscious mind. It isn't uh, so much our conscious mind that's in the driver's seat. It's being affected and influenced and steered by the unconscious.
So the unconscious mind in Jung's view holds two types of memory, the personal and the collective. The personal unconscious would simply be everything we've ever experienced as an individual, but can't quite remember. And then we have the collective unconscious, which is described as a shared memory that's been passed down from ancestors. And then the authors describe that the collective unconscious, from their point of view, constitutes folk soul, which is a spiritual and literal tie, you know, through the bloodlines uh, to the ancestors who have gone before us. And then that archetypes are expressions of these untouchable memories and how instincts see themselves. And that people of similar cultural and ethnic backgrounds tend to have uh, similar architects. Uh, they archetypes, they, they view them in a similar way. They react to them in a very similar way because that's what constitutes uh, their cultural norm. And obviously this evolves over time and there's always exceptions for individuals. But, you know, you know this, is our, this is kind of our baseline. This is how things generally go. And the archetypes also are a point of comparison for ourselves. It gives us something to strive for, something to emulate. It helps us to become so we can fulfill various roles we take on in life. And also it teaches us how to respond to a variety of circumstances we encounter in life. And this brings us to Joseph Campbell. And the authors focused on two of his primary theories. The first is that myths are best understood as metaphors that speak to the unconscious mind. And the second is that myth serves essential functions in human development. Campbell put forth that mythologies serve primarily four functions in human development. The first is to help people understand their world and to embrace life and all it has to offer. The second is creation of a worldview that aligns with natural law that helps people function within that order. The third is encouragement of a defined so moral and or social order. In other words, this is what we as a people think is important and this is how we do that thing. And then the fourth is that it helps individuals successfully navigate all stages and tests in life. Now, in the case of both Young and Campbell, the ultimate purpose of myth is to teach people how to human, uh, which is an inherently spiritual task. Uh, part four of the section is called Gods. Here's where the authors address the questions of what is a god? What are gods like? Are the gods real? And of course, the authors gave the caveat that while they are offering their views, there is considerable debate on these questions and for good reason, and each individual must ultimately come to their own conclusions. And again, the authors brought up the idea of using the four methods that we previously discussed uh, for examining mythology and just applying them to uh, what gods might be. Uh, and just as a reminder, you know, literal truth, distorted history, mistaken explanation, and metaphor. Uh, but they admit that going this route only takes us so far. Uh, what I can say for my own part is that I truly do believe that the gods are, every, are individuals, and I have every reason to believe this. Uh, just through my own experiences, when I have had the privilege to encounter even, you know, the shadow of a presence of, of the deity. Uh, they have independent will with capabilities that are beyond human reach, and they operate on a larger scale than we do. They can act and affect our realm or not as they deem fitting. And over the years, I have had the privilege to be graced with some interactions with the gods through rituals, deep meditations, and dream work. And of course, with Loki, he is a very immediate and constant presence in my life. It's not that he's always looking over my shoulder, but he's never far away. Uh, the energies of the beings that I've encountered are even more distinct, individualized, and recognizable than the energies of fellow human beings. And as a result, I absolutely reject the idea that divinity is just one great big blob, or that every known deity is just a facet of some overarching god or an overarching goddess. And now it's true, I and I agree that the gods are often known by more than one name. This happens even within you know, one pantheon. Uh, but not every deity who shares a similar area of concern and is thought to be the equivalent of another deity in another pantheon, I don't believe that they are always the same being. Sometimes they are. I mean, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, uh, I have yet to hear from anyone who followed those gods that they viewed them as absolutely different and distinct from one another. You know, no, they just, they changed their names and that didn't, that seems to be about it. And I think that it holds a uh, very true from the Norse and the Germanic pantheons. I think we are essentially uh, looking at, you know, different forms of the same names for the same gods. Now, when it comes to gods, obviously there are things that are not understood and may never be understood. And perhaps it's not for ours to understand. And if a person concentrates their energy on that mystery of I must unravel the gods and I must be able to clearly define and quantify and measure this thing, 
I, I worry that it would blind a person to the lessons the gods are actually teaching. You know, the little nudges of direction they give when people are willing to listen. You know, they're saying, you know, you're so caught up in trying to figure us out. You're not attending to your life. You know, you're, wh where are you? What are you doing? What are, what are you supposed to be doing? People, it, it becomes a distraction for them. So I, I certainly... That, that is, that's the direction that I try to steer away from. I think if we can make peace with the unknown and that there will always be some things that are, are unknown to us, I think that's part of our spiritual journey. Uh, part five of this section is titled The Ancient Gods. At this point, the authors state that the gods have walked with their people essentially since time began, and they are still the same gods we interact with and venerate today. The heathen concept of gods, which is common amongst Indo-European peoples, is that the gods are very human-like in their appearance and their behaviors. In a way, we're kind of the miniaturized version of them, which would explain both the sense of connection we can have with the gods and also how the gods still exceed our ability to understand them. We are akin to the gods, and the spark of the divine within us is, as the authors put it, the blood gift of the gods. It makes us their descendants, their family. It is an undeniable and unbreakable bond. Now, they made a point about heathen worship not being a propitiation. Uh, that is, it's, I'll give sacrifices to you to, to appease me, so to appease you, so please don't squash me like a bug. Uh, that's, that's not how it works in heathen spirituality. The gods are not looking for bribes. Uh, they are not collecting slaves. And they aren't, you know, hyper-focused and micromanaging our behavior, looking for an excuse to punish humanity. For us, uh, worship, whether it is in the form of sacrifice or anything else, it's something that's offered in the spirit of friendship, in the spirit of family, in the spirit of kinship. It's acknowledging their worth and the value we place upon our relationship with them and for the gifts that they have given us. So uh, this sums up the first half of the section. I am saving the second half for next week. It's a lot of involved material that I think deserves its own video. Uh, so far into the book, I think the authors are doing an outstanding job of explaining concepts in a very straightforward way, which I appreciate because nothing irritates me more than when authors or people in general speak or write in a way that's it's just pretty clear they're trying to inflate themselves and their intellect. So, you know, you can be all very impressed by, by it. Uh, that, that doesn't fool anybody with good sense and it obscures the point. And it can cause people to, um, to not pay attention to the value of the ideas in and of themselves. Then that brings me to another book I'm intending to go through after we finish up with the Heathen Handbook. It was the uh, first book I ever read about the Norse Germanic gods, and the author gave me such a bad impression of himself, the religion, and the gods themselves that it just drove me away from them for years. Uh, so there's a mini preview for down the road. Uh, first, we go over a book that made sense to me and made me feel enthused about this journey and that it assured me that I am moving in the right direction for me. And after that, we'll look at a book that had the exact opposite effect and talk about why. It does make a difference how information is conveyed. I mean, and when we... When we think of that, you know, when we think about these authors, you know, pretty much all we know about them is, is what they wrote in their books or what we see of them in their videos. That's essentially their reputation. And uh, when and what they write about spirituality, that becomes the part of the reputation of the faith. Same whole truths for video concepts. And of course, when people see this, uh, that really determines whether we as a, as a faith group, uh, how we are viewed by the rest of society. Are we an honorable, moral people with sensible ideas, or are we something else entirely? Are we something kooky, or are we something awful? Uh, is If paganism is going to reclaim its proper place in the world, then I think we do need to start asking ourselves uh, what we as individuals and what the broader community does as a whole to further that goal, and whether or not what we're doing currently is actually a detriment to that goal. So lots of uh, room for serious meditation there. So uh, thank you for hanging out with me throughout this longer video. I would be very curious about your own impressions about uh, what I've said about this book. If you've read this book, I would love to hear about your impressions of this section. Or of course, if you are just a fellow student of, Na of Norse spirituality, uh, let me know what you're doing. What are you reading? What are you watching? What are you doing? Um, how are, are things coming together for you? What have you been thinking about? I would, I would love to have a conversation with you. So you could let me know in the comment section, or you could go to the description box, uh, click on the link to the Gilded server. It's called Blackbird's Brew, and you can join us and start a conversation there. I would really enjoy it, and I uh, hope to see you there soon. Uh, but that will do it for right now, and I will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>